What up, y'all? This is your boy, Mr. Downtown Ray Mello, and you're listening to the Entertainment Report on iHeartRadio for Tuesday, June 23rd, 2015, delivering some major stories and trends going on in the world of entertainment and beyond. You can follow the show on Facebook or on Twitter, facebook.com slash the Entertainment Report with Ray Mello, that's R-A-Y-M-E-L-O, or on Twitter at the Enter Report. You can listen to the show anytime you want on iHeartRadio. Just go to iHeart.com, search for the Entertainment Report, and it'll take you to the page. James Horner, the consummate film composer known for his heart-tugging scores for such classic movies as Field of Dreams, Braveheart, and Titanic, for which he won two Academy Awards, died Monday in a plane crash near Santa Barbara. He was 61. His death was confirmed by Sylvia Patricia, who was identified on Horner's film music page as his assistant. Patricia wrote on Facebook on Monday, We have lost an amazing person with a huge heart and unbelievable talent. He died doing what he loved. Thank you for all the support and love and see you down the road. Horner was piloting the small aircraft when it crashed into a remote area about 60 miles north of Santa Barbara, officials said. An earlier report noted that the plane, which was registered to the composer, had gone down, but the pilot had not been identified. Horner's agency, Goldfrain Schwartz, released the following statement. Although we are all awaiting official confirmation that our dear friend and client James Horner was in fact the pilot, we are shocked and deeply saddened to learn that his single-engine aircraft was involved in a fatal crash yesterday morning in northern Ventura County. Our thoughts and prayers remain with James's family at this difficult time. We can offer no further comment for the time being except to ask that the family's privacy be respected in the days ahead. For his work on the 1997 Best Picture winner, Titanic, directed by James Cameron, Horner captured the Oscar for original dramatic score, and he nabbed another Academy Award for original song, shared with lyricist Will Jennings, For My Heart Will Go On, performed by Celine Dion. Horner said in a 2009 interview with the Los Angeles Times, My job, and it's sometimes I discuss with Jim all the time, is to make sure at every turn of the film it's something the audience can feel with their heart. When we lose a character, when, we, when someone wins, when somebody loses, when someone disappears, at all times I keep tracking constantly of what the heart is supposed to be feeling. That is my primary role. His score for Titanic sold a whopping 27 million copies worldwide. His fruitful partnership with Cameron also netted him Oscar noms for original score for the blockbusters Alien in 1986 and Avatar in 2009. The pair reportedly were also at work on Avatar sequels. The Los Angeles native earned 10 Oscar nominations in all, also being recognized for his work on two other Best Picture winners, Braveheart in 1995 and A Beautiful Mind in 2001. He also received nominations for the movie An American Tale, um, in 1986, Field of Dreams, 1989, Apollo 13, 1995, and House of Sand and Fog in 2003. Always busy, Horner had three films coming out soon. Southpaw, the boxing drama that stars Jake Gyllenhaal and Rachel McAdams, and it's due in theaters in July. Jean Jacques and Anud Wolf Tonham out in September, and the 33, a drama based on the 2010 mining disaster in Chile that is set for November. His lengthy film resume includes The Lady in Red in 1975, Wolfen 1981, Star Trek II, The Roth of Khan 1982, Star Trek III, The Search for Spock 1983, Red Heat 1988, Glory 1989, The Rocketeer 1991, Patriot Games 1992, Searching for Bobby Fischer 1993, Jumanji 1995, How the Grinch Stole Christmas 2000, Troy 2004, and The Amazing Spider-Man 2012. His father was two-time Oscar-winning art director, set designer Harry Horner, who won an Oscar for The Hearers and The Hustler. Horner spoke about the state of his career in a December interview with David Hochette. He said, I'm much choosier. I don't want to be doing these movies na that now 85 or 90 composers want as opposed to six. And now all these movies, action movies, I don't get offered all the movies, obviously, but I see a lot of them, and I do get to ask to do a lot of them, and I just know they're not asking me to do something that I can do, something original. They're asking me to do some, something of a formula, and I'm too rebellious. Hollywood went on social media to mourn the loss of James Horner. Celine Dion, who sang the massive global hit My Heart Will Go On, co-written by Horner for the movie Titanic, released a statement expressing her grief. Renee and I are deeply saddened by the tragic death of James Horner. He will always remain a great composer in our hearts. James played an important part in my career. We will miss him. We offer his family and friends our deepest sympathies. 
fellow film composers have also been shocked by Horner's passing. French composer Alexandre Desplat, who won an Oscar for scoring the Grand Budapest Hotel, said, It is a great tragedy for all composers to hear about James Horner's accident. We've lost one of our most talented and respected colleagues. His music will remain always. Eight-time Oscar winner composer Alan Menken, who... Um, wrote Beauty and the Beast, Aladdin, and The Little Mermaid said, I count James Horner among the very best film composers of our generation. His work is stirring, emotionally powerful, and broadly evocative. Although we only met on a few occasions, I will always cherish the memory of him and his wonderful work. Uh, Marco Bertrami, composer of The Hot Hurt Locker, World War Z, and 310 to Yuma said, James Horner was one of the greatest film composer legends. I can help feeling that his passing marks the end of an era. Many others in the entertainment industry took to social media to express their thoughts and condolences. Ron Howard tweeted, Brilliant composer James Horner, friend and collaborator in seven movies, has tragically died in a plane crash. My heart aches for his loved ones. Academy Award winning actor Russell Crowe wrote, My sincere condolences to the family, loved ones, and friends of James Horner. Hashtag a beautiful mind. Director James Wan uh, tweeted, If we hold on together, I know our dreams will never die. Dreams see us through to forever. Uh, rest in peace, James Horner. You'll be sadly missed. Actress Deva Messing wrote, We lost a master today. Rest in peace, James Horner. Your music will live forever. Kirstie Alley tweeted, I'm so sad to hear about James Horner. He scored the first movie I did, Star Trek II. Great composer, great person, huge loss. Rob Lowe tweeted, There's nothing that shapes my movie-going experience more than the musical genius of James Horner. He will live on through the ages. Richard Kelly tweeted, James Horner helped me define my love of cinema as a child, one of the greatest film composers of all time. So tragic if he's gone. Kyle Newman wrote, My favorite James Horner scores, Braveheart, Willow, Rocketeer, Apollo 13, Legends of the Fall, Aliens, Apocalypto, Cruel, Titanic, Trek 2. Max Zoller Seitz uh, tweeted, The films James Horner scored were often sentimental, but his music was always emotional, and he understood the difference. Ryan Turk said, Rest in peace, James Horner. Brian Tyler said, so sad by the loss of James Horner, an incredible inspiration and a brilliant composer. I just can't believe it. Academy Award-winning composer Diane Warren wrote, uh, rest in peace, James Horner. Thank you for the beautiful music. We will miss you with what beautiful music was yet to come. Comedian Seth MacFarlane uh, tweeted, incredibly saddened to hear about the loss of James Horner. I grew up loving his music. He leaves behind a spectacular mu musical legacy. Comedian Josh Gad wrote, listening to the hashtag Braveheart score on the radio right now in honor of hashtag James Horner, reminded of what a huge loss his passing is. Frank Marshall tweeted, brilliant composer James Horner, friend and collaborator in many movies, has tragically died in a plane crash. My heart is with his family. Actor Ron Perlman uh, tweeted, I am lucky to be able to say I was in a movie that was scored by hashtag James Horner, Flights of Angels, Dear Sweet Beautiful Mind. Pop group one Republic wrote, R.I.P. James Horner, you were one insanely gifted composer and writer. Braveheart, Avatar, Titanic, your music was inspiring and will continue to be. And Rachel Wood wrote, I still listen to the Land Before Time soundtrack on set when I need a, a good cry. Big part of my childhood. Rest in peace, James Horner. Singer Josh Groban wrote, he wrote me a song that has such a special meaning to me. We'll always remember you, James, R.I.P. Katie Keurig uh, tweeted, so sad about the brilliant composer James Horner, who wrote the theme song of uh, at CBS Evening News during my tenure, a lovely, talented man. Pop singer Ellie Gooding wrote, I am so sad to hear about James Horner. He composed the most beautiful soundtrack of all, of all time. Actor Gary Sinise uh, tweeted, Sad to see James Horner, wonderful compo composer of Apollo 13, and so many others go condolences to his family. Jamie, Jamie Bell wrote, devastated about James Horner. Singer Charlotte Church said, so, uh, tweeted, so sad to hear the news that James Horner has passed away. I was lucky enough to work with him. He was awesome. And Mark Webb tweeted, last time I spoke to J.H., he was scoring for a kid at AFI, two Oscars, and he agreed to score a student film. What generosity. Hashtag RIP James Horner. And one other death to add, another star has passed away. Dick Van Patten, who played the family patriarch on the ABC series Eight is Enough, has died. His public 
Jeff Ballard, confirmed to the Hollywood Reporter. He was 86. The soft-spoken actor died Tuesday morning in St. John's Hospital in Santa Monica due to complications from diabetes. Ballard said in a statement he was the kindest man you could ever meet in a life. A loving family man, they don't make them like him anymore. Survivors include his wife of 62 years, Pat, a former June Taylor dancer, son Niels, Jimmy, and Vincent, sister Joyce Van Patten, and niece Talia Balsam, all actors, and his half-brother Emmy-winning director Tim Van Patten. Van Patten's Eight is Enough character Tom Bradford was named number 33 in TV Guide's list of the 50 greatest dads of all time in 2004, and his 2009 autobiography was titled 80 is Not Enough. It is enough, an hour-long comedy drama about a family with eight kids ran for five seasons on ABC from 1977 to 1981. His character played a columnist for a Sacramento newspaper. The show was based on the life of a real newspaper man, and the series spawned a couple of reunion telefilms. Van Pan recalled in a 2011 interview with the Archive of American Television, Before Eight is Enough, there was Father Knows Best, all goody, goody, goody. On Eight is Enough, we dealt with real problems. In his, in his seven-decade career, Van Patten appeared in all medias on the stage, radio, and more than 600 shows, televisions, and films. He was seen in the Mel Brooks comedy High Anxiety in 1977, Spaceballs in 1987, and Robin Hood Men in Tights in 1993, and he portrayed Friar Tuck on a Brooks sitcom When Things Go Rotten. A Disney regular, he also starred in such family films as Super Dad in 1973, The Strongest Man in the World 1975, The Shaggy DA 1976, Gus 1976, and Freaky Friday in 1976. Most recently, Van Patten appeared in, on such TV series as Arrested Development, The Sarah Silverman Program, That 70s Show, and Hot in Cleveland. Van Patten was 86 years old. Sony has found its newest web slinger. Tom Holland will star as the Marvel superhero Spider-Man, a character that has been played in recent years by Tobey Maguire in the Sam Raimi's helm Spider-Man trilogy and Andrew Garfield in the pair of Mark Webb directed Amazing Spider-Man films. John Watts is set to direct Spider-Man. He earlier directed the coming-of-age thriller Cop Car, which premiered at Sundance this year. With Holland in the lead, the franchise is now ready for rebooting for a new series of Sony films, the first of which arrives in theaters July 28, 2017, but not before the character first appears in Marvel Studios' Captain America's Civil War. The decision comes after Steve Test screening in Atlanta May 30th, which saw Holland, who appeared as one of Naomi Watts' sons in the acclaimed tsunami drama The Impossible, and Asia Butterfield, a child star from Hugo and Ender Games. Those tests with Marvel head honcho Kevin Feig, former head and now a Spider producer Amy Pascal, and Civil War director Directors Joe and Anthony Russo present were the culmination of a worldwide search in which the producers looked at over 1,500 boys from around the globe. Sources says the decision came down to Rollin and and actor Charlie Rowe, a British actor who appeared on Fox's short-lived Red Band Society. With the producers favoring the older actors, and the deal were asked to retest. Holland turned 19, year old in, 19 years old in June. Still, the studios were very meticulous in their decision-making. Marvel and Sony made a point to recast Peter Parker, a.k.a. Spider-Man, as a teenager, as the new series will be set entirely in high school. Given that the performance of last year's Amazing Spider-Man 2, just north of was, off $700 million worldwide, was off by Spider-Man standards, Ramony Spider-Man 3 earned $891 million worldwide, Sony is looking to reinvigorate the franchise. Watts, meanwhile, beat out contenders such as Jonathan Levine, the teams of John Francis Daly and Jonathan M. Goldstein. Sources said it was Fig that made the ultimate call regarding the new director. Fig said in a statement, as with James Gunn, Josh Whedon, and the Russo brothers, we love finding new and exciting voices to bring these characters to life. We spent a lot of time with John and find his take and working inspiration. Tom Rothman, Sony Pictures Motion Pictures Group Chairman, said in a statement, It is a big day here at Sony. Kevin, Amy, and their teams have done an incredible job. The Marvel process is very thorough, and that's why their results are so outstanding. I'm confident Spider-Man will be no exception. I've worked with a number of up-and-coming directors who have gone on to become superstars and believe that John is just an, such an outstanding talent. For Spidey himself, we saw many terrific young actors, but Tom's screen tests were special.
The latest iteration of Nick Pizzolatto's True Detective kicked off on Sunday night, and its audience marked nearly a 40% uptick from the first go-around. HBO's 9 p.m. telecast averaged 3.2 million million viewers in initial live plus same-day ratings, making it the show's second-highest night of audience today behind only the freshman finale. The, the evening's tally higher and maybe is an understatement of what the show will bring in the over coming weeks. The first season of True Detective passed 11 v- viewers per episode once the entire audience, Encores, DVR, HBO Go, and On Demand was taken into account. That's one reason why HBO is no longer touting live plus same date stats. True Detective's first season kicked off under much different circumstances. In addition, to its more favorably uh, January open, half of its A-list cast, Matthew McConaughey, was enjoying a hot streak in the months running up to his Dallas Buyers Club Oscar win. It still stands as the most watched H- HBO original drama premiere since Boardwalk Empire and ended up being one, the most watched freshman season since Six Feet Under. This new season starring Colin Farrell, Vince Vaughn, Rachel McAdams, and Taylor Kish marks a competitive narrative departure from the first. Sunday also marked the premiere of HBO's new comedies, Ballers and The Brink. Broader than some of the paid cable network's recent half hours, their Live Plus showings were strong, averaging a respective 2.2 and 1.6 million viewers. Full details on True Detective's sophomore premiere, Ballers and The Brink, will be available in a month where Live Plus seven-day ratings have been combined with nonlinear plays. NBC is closing the book on Hannibal. The network has canceled Brian Fuller's Silence of the Lambs prequel series after three seasons. The full 13-episode third season will run its course on Thursdays at 10, concluding August 27. Sources told a Hollywood Reporter that there may have been a rights issue at the center of the decision to end the series as Fuller had wanted to introduce Clarice Starling in season four with the rights to the characters previously portrayed by Jodie Foster said to be unavailable. Producers Gaumont TV are currently exploring options to find another home for the series with EP Martha De Laurentiis confirming as much via Twitter. Fuller said in the statement NBC has allowed us to craft a television series that no other broadcast network would have dared and kept us on the air for three seasons despite cancellation bear chime ratings and images that would have shred the eyeballs of lesser standards and practice enforcers. Uh, Jen Stock and her team have been fantastic partners in creative supporting Beyond Measures. Hannibal is finishing his last course at NBC's table this summer, but a hungry cannibal can always dine again. And personally, I look forward to my next meal with NBC. Added NBC in a statement, we have been tremendously proud of Hannibal over its three seasons. Brian and his team of writers and producers, as well as an incredible actors, have brought a visual pele of Storytelling that has been second to none in all television. Uh, that has uh, broadcast or cable. We thank producers Gaumann and everyone involved in this show for their tireless efforts that have been made that made Hannibal an incredible experience for the audiences around the world. The drama stars Hugh Dancy and Maz Mikkelsen uh, returned June 4th with 2.57 million total viewers before slipping to a series low the following week when only 1.66 million tuned in against competition for the NBA Finals. The series had been a hit with critics who praised Fuller, um, who's produced Pushing Daisies and Wonderfalls, for pushing the boundaries of, the, of broadcast television with the show's graphic and visually creative depths. Hannibal has been one of NBC's fault to summer bridge series as more broadcasters continue to program originals year-round. NBC thus far has focused on imports and co-productions to fit its summer roster, while other networks like CBS uh, focus on pricey sci-fi fairs a la Under the Dome and, and the upcoming Zoo. Fuller, meanwhile, has already lined up his next gig. Stars recently Grinlit Neil Gaiman adopted American Gods to series with Fuller serving as a co-showrunner on the urban fantasy novel that was previously in development at HBO. The move to cancel Hannibal ends Fuller's relationship with NBC, where he previously produced a reboot of The Monsters, whose prized series pilot ultimately aired as a Halloween movie after the project was scrapped. The June 18th announcement that Lester Holt will be the permanent anchor of NBC Nightly News while Brian Williams will be moved to cable network MSNBC 
closes a particularly painful chapter for the network. Holt 56 has been Williams' able fill-in and the weekend anchor of Nightly since 2007, while also anchoring news magazine Dateline. His willingness to work multiple jobs and perseverance through marathon live anchoring situations during the 2000 presidential election recount, the terrorist attack of September 11, 2001, and the 2012 massacre at Sandy Hook Elementary has earned a reputation as a workhorse and the nickname Iron Pants. But his ascent also comes with historical significance. Holt is among only a handful of African Americans to anchor an evening news broadcast. Max Robinson co-anchored ABC's World News Tonight in the 1970s, and Holt's promotion comes as a particularly fraught time for race relations in America. Holt uh, talked to The Hollywood Reporter about his relationship with, with Williams, how he found out... Uh, he was getting the job and that he does not need the managing ed- editor title. Hip hop mogul P. Diddy was released from jail late Monday night after an alleged assault with a weight room kettlebell at the athletics facility of UCLA where his son is on the football team, police said. Diddy, 45, whose real name is Sean Combs, was freed after posting bail several hours of after his afternoon arrest jail record show. Officials did not identify the victim of the assault or said what had led to it. No one was seriously injured, campus police said in the statement. The jail rec- records show that Combs' bail was $160,000, but sheriff officials reached by phone said he posted $50,000. The reason for the discrepancy wasn't clear. Combs' son, Justin Combs, is a redshirt junior defensive back on the UCLA football team, which ha- he has been working out on campus. He has played in just a handful of games in his three years with the team. The son of another major rap star also plays football for the Bruins. Snoop Dogg's son, Cordell Brodus, is a wide receiver who signed with the team this year. Football coach Jim Mora thanked his staff for their professionalism in handling the situation. Mora said in the statement from the campus police, this is an unfortunate incident for all parties involved. While the UCPD continues to review this matter, we'll, we'll let the legal process run its course and refrain from further comment at this time. In a statement, Combs' rep calls reports of the events wholly inaccurate. The various accounts of the events and charges that are being reported are wholly inaccurate. The rep said, what can we say now is that actions taken by Mr. Combs were solely defensive in nature to protect the son, himself and his son. We're confident that once the true facts are revealed, the case will be dismissed. The arrest first reported by TMZ is the latest of several allegations of violence by Combs. He was acquitted of bribery and weapons-related charges in a connection with the 1999 shooting at a New York club, nightclub. A jury cleared Combs of firing a weapon during the dispute that wounded three bystanders as well as bribing his chauffeur to take the rap. Combs was arrested in 1999 for his involvement in the beating of former Interscope executive Steve Stout in New York. Combs apologized. The charges were reduced. He was ordered to attend air, an, air, an anger management class. Combs and Stout have since mended their, their relationship, um, appearing on stage together at cons in 2013. Earlier this year, an Arizona man accused Combs of punching him in the face at a Super Bowl party. Combs was not arrested. After a rough launch, Jay-Z's title has lost a corporate leader. Um, a rep for the music streaming company told The Hollywood Reporter, we can confirm interim CEO Peter Tonstan is no longer with the company. We're thankful to Peter for stepping in as interim CEO, um, and we wish him the best luck for the future. Tonstad has yet to be replaced, according to the streaming ser- uh, company. Tidal will be transitioning to a permanent CEO as part of our strategic plan to create a leading platform. The rep continues, and currently, executives in New York and Oslo, Norway, will continue to lead our rapidly developing innovation and co- content initiatives until our new CEO is in place. The announcement comes two days after Taylor Swift convinced one of Tidal's biggest competitors, Apple Music, to revise its payment policy during its upcoming three-month trial period. Apple had initially refused to pay labels during the trial, but Sunday, Swift penned an open letter criticizing Apple for the no-pay period, writing, I find it to be shocking disappointing and completely unlike this historically progressive and generous company. Apple responded hours later, promising to reverse the initial plan. Tidal has also faced considerable competition from, from competitor Spotify, which has continued to dominate the streaming space since Tidal entered to much fanfare in March. And finally, 
Mark Wahlberg's promotional schedule for TED, too, includes TV spots, interviews, red carpet premieres, and surprisingly, an onstage New Kids on the Block reunion for the first time in 20 years. The actor and original member of the group, who left very early on for a solo career, stopped by Madison Square Garden on Monday night for the band's second show at the New York City venue. The band is currently touring with TLC and Nelly as part of their arena John, the main event. The event also included special guest 50 Cent, who brought Wahlberg on stage as seen uh, in the clip, and Biz Markey. And that is your entertainment report for Tuesday, June 23rd, 2015. I'm your host, Mr. Dan Tamar Mello. I'll be back tomorrow to deliver some of the major stories and trends going on in the world of entertainment and beyond. You can follow the show on Facebook or on Twitter, facebook.com slash the entertainment report with Ray Mello. That's R-A-Y-M-E-L-O. Or on Twitter at the enter report. You can listen to this episode or any previous episodes of the show on iHeartRadio. Anytime you want, just go to iHeart.com. Search for the Entertainment Report, and it'll take you to the page. Good night, and good luck.